Marissa, welcome to Stories in AI. How are you this Friday afternoon? Feeling wonderful. Sunny day in Zurich. Thanks. That is How about awesome. you? It's uh, it's sunny day every day here in Austin, Texas. That said, this year the weather shifts are very apparent. We get we got in a lot more rain than it, than what we're used to usually, but it's I can't complain. It's beautiful, except our COVID nineteen Delta variant cases are rising up, so that's a little bit of concerning. But you know for we're sure. safe. Everybody's here, so it's all good. Uh, thanks again for taking the time today, and I want to just get right into it and. Why don't you just start off with tell me your personal story and your journey and how you found AI in the midst of everything that you were doing? <laughs> yeah, well, first of all, thank you for inviting me. It's a huge pleasure to be on your show. Um, yeah, how did I ha huh? <laughs> let me let me think. So actually, it was a few years ago. So I mean, I've always been very interested into you know Matrix, Star Wars kind of things. But um, I never thought that I would be actually, you know, earning money with this. Um, and uh, so, you know, I've done several jobs. I'm not the uh, high-flying academic. I learned cosmetician. So, I mean, I clean toes and fingernails uh, once in my life. And awesome. uh, at one point of my I never life. Knew that. <laughs> I never knew that, by the way. But that's awesome. Yeah, nobody does. And I kind of surprise or sometimes also shock people when they hear that I also did a very, you know, weird job once. <laughs> so that's also very funny. Some people don't even believe me. So, but, uh, and also I painted the nails of Alanis Morissette just, you know, for the record. <laughs> Anyways, nothing to do with what I'm doing now. Um, so I'm a little bit of, you know, I started, start, I started really late with, you know, going into the more academic world, um, I started studying and I studied business psychology. I thought that was a really cool topic. I really liked, you know, dealing with humans. And um, I always want to have, you know, I was always fascinated with humans. I mean, as a cosmetician, you deal with humans every day and feet and nails. But, you know, mostly you deal with humans who tell you all your problems. And so um, I always had this thing with humans. And at one point I started to study and... Um, mostly in the organizational psychology field and the educational field. And um, at one point, um, I've been to a seminar, actually. It was in a university uh, in Zurich. And uh, I had uh, someone from IBM came to our school, and she told us about the debater and AI and all these things, you know. And, you know, I was fascinated. I was like, my God, that's so cool. All these cool things we can do. And, you know, you can ease teaching with all these, with all this cool tech stuff. And, uh, you know, and I was super focused on the speaker. And then I looked around and I was like, what, what's happening here? Something was really bizarre because um, all these teachers, it was a teacher's class, basically. They were super scared. They were like, what's happening here? And I was like, what's happening here? So, and I was looking around and, you know, as I told you, I'm mostly fascinated with humans. So what fascinated me most was, you know, that, 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 the bizarre fear that people had, you know, why do they fear AI? What's going on? Like all this new things, technology, what, what, what's going on here? And um, so that, that was so interesting that I, you know, started basically to switch my jobs and go into research and using what I know and studied from psychology uh, and put that into basically, I call it, uh, or it's called human AI interaction research. So I'm trying to understand how people feel, think, or relate to technology, specifically AI. That is fascinating. And um, it looked like there is a little bit of echo on your end. Um, okay. But we'll try it again. Uh, but no, that is fascinating, Marissa. And in the midst of trying to navigate your way between psychology and then into AI, what did you find in that inter intersection of psychology and artificial intelligence? <sighs> Um, now, that's more personal opinion. So it's, um, I think what I found and what I'm working on now is that AI is not just a tool. I think this is something you hear a lot, you know, AI is just a tool. It's just a means to an end. It's just, you know, like 
bookkeeping or your screwdriver. But um, from what I've learned, read, and experienced in the past five, four, five years is there is more to it. And and I'm saying that not, you know, it's not positive, it's not negative. It's it's just as it is. I think there's more to it. People build some sort of, you know, relationship to it. So people interact with with something that has maybe some sense of agency. We have to start thinking. We have to start doubting what this other thing on the other end is doing. And uh, this is not happening with any, you know, with a regular, you know, screwdriver, you know, you just use it. So, um, of course, there's, you know, it's not, this is not proven by science yet. So this is just my opinion, basically, and try, or actually, let's say what I'm trying to look for scientifically now. But um, so what I'm trying to say is, you know, there's something more to it. So it kind of changes the dynamic. Uh, we interact in our society, we inter how we interact with other people, how we see ourselves. It has, you know, it brings so much more changes with us as humans, our behavior, subconsciously or consciously. So it's things we also often do not even notice. So um, this is why uh, this is, I think, the thing I, I, I'm, 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 I'm concerned in positive and negative ways most about that you know ai is more than just a tool no it's it's fascinating even though you're saying it's your opinion there is i think beginning of enough empirical evidence on this right so uh, we all interact with series or any of the intelligent assistants as and we refer to them as a he or a she and we humanize that relationship right right and although you know these are all not really AGI and narrow sets of intelligence that's does a task and stuff. I always wondered that this was because, you know, it, the, the sign of intelligence that it shows makes us feel a different kinds of relationship with that system, right? Unlike just, you know, a spreadsheet or a word processor, right? Um, so I always thought it was just as simple as that saying, hey, it's showing some intelligence. So we just re re reacting it or re having a relationship like you would have with another intelligent being not necessarily a human being, but even like we would deal with a pet, right? Something like that. So explore this a little bit for me, because I read your article on anthropomorphism, right? The whole idea of actually how we change that, that relationship behavior with, um, with, with intelligent things or non-living pieces of intelligence, if you will, right? Explore that a little bit for me. What have you found so far? What are you thinking about in this, in this place? Yeah, I mean, uh, maybe just a few words about um, anthropomorphism. Uh, is, so anthropomorphism basically is, uh, I see it as, a, you know, it's, it's, it's a capacity. It's a, we have this tremendous capacity to see human in non-human agents. So we, 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 can't, we, we project, we attribute, you know, agency through to them. We think they can do something. We can. We think they're smart. They're intelligent. We think they have characteristics that humans have. And and what I what I basically say in my article is that you cannot not anthropomorphize. You cannot not humanize. So, because what you often hear is that you know people should stop humanizing machines. They're just tools. They're just uh, blah blah blah. I say no. It's yeah. I mean yeah. You're right. But the point is, you just can't stop humans from doing that. So it's very. Um, I think it's very unhelpful to think about strategies how to, to dehumanize machines. I mean, this will come automatically. You know, the more you know, the more you understand machines. But, you know, coming from a place of saying, oh, you know, you're stupid, don't humanize machines, that's really unproductive. So, um, and, you know, talking about intelligence, and it kind of, I kind of want to get, you know, feed this back to this topic of intelligence, because I think, you know, artificial intelligence is a huge term that was, you know, because of this term intelligence, super hyped, because people, you know, attribute too much um capacities and agency to machines. Um, so we kind of wanted to de demystify this a little bit. And you also mentioned Siri and Alexa and such. 
And what we did first is we kind of, you know, uh, we kind of developed a intelligent quotient, intelligence quotient for conversational AI. We wanted to know how smart are they? What can they really do? And uh, because, you know, you'll never find out because it's a black box, you know, it's, it's hidden there. You know, you'll never find out how they do it. So it's, 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 it's a good object of, um, of, of investigating AI, a conversational AI in this case, because you'll never be able to look how it works to look into it. So, um, the reason why we're doing it is not only, you know, for fun to see is Siri dumber, dumber than Alexa. I mean, that's the fun part of it as well. And you kind of really get to know what they actually can do. But the, the, the most interesting part of this, of this is, uh, we want to know um, how, you know, uh, what people expect of Siri and Alexa, how, 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 how smart they think she, I wanted to say she, <laughs> how smart hey. this conversational AI is versus what the real answer is. And you're going to be, you're, you're most likely uh, going to be surprised how, um, how wrong people estimate conversational AI, even, you know, even if you're a classic programmer and, you know, you could say, okay, they know tech, even they don't have no idea how smart they are, uh, they are or if they could answer these or that, this or that question. So my point is, um, intelligence is, 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 is also something, you know, is this something, you know, you humanize? Is it something that is just, uh, you know, part of humans' capacities? Or, you know, how could you translate it into machines? Should we even call it AI? Is that already so much anthropomorphism that it's hurting um, the industry and whatsoever? So long story short, all these terms and words and things are really messing up with the human brain that likes to, you know, put things into boxes and try to understand things and try to find patterns. And yeah, we're figuring out these things. We try to simplify intelligence, but in fact, we made things much harder because we figured out that things go far beyond intelligence and performance. There's many other um, variables that um, are critical in the human AI interaction sphere huh. yeah. you know it, it it is fascinating because it, it opens up multiple different threads in my head when i'm listening to you right one is the study of the impact of you know machines we can actually put all kinds of microscopes and responsible ai frameworks and stuff to understand what's going behind the 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 black box that is ai but the reality is things are not happening behind that black box it's happening in the human mind and in our association, it's a, it's a psychology problem, not so much a technical problem to solve. So that's one thing that I took away. Second thing, this whole notion of associating agency to intelligent systems, right, that it's a human way of doing it, might actually be, uh, and, and to your point, we shouldn't really ignore that and say you shouldn't do that and move on. But in fact, turn that around and say, how do we embrace that to make it more productive for us? So I was, as an example, I was talking to, this gentleman, Mark Rolston, um, and he's going to be on the show and we'll launch it around the time we launch this. Uh, Mark is a CEO founder of a, he's a longtime design person. So he, in his, his fascination is human experiences and interactions that what is the interface between technology and the human being, right? He's a founder of a company called Argo Design, which is now owned by DXC Technology. So Mark had this notion and he and I have been talking about this for like a few, three, four years now around this whole notion of meta me, right? Wherein we have this notion that we, with the, the lines between our digital self and our physical self, our own self is blurring so much that we will start really, you know, losing sight of where the line is, right? What that leads to in the positive, the best outcome is you will have digital avatars who do things for you that you can assign agency to, or you can actually, you will trust to go do things on your behalf. The flip side of that is that we all will, will go crazy, right? So there's so many different outcomes on that. So this is very fascinating because I, I, I think I should connect the two of you too. I think you'll have a lot of fun talking yeah. about Isn't it. Isn't there this movie where people, you know, just stay in their homes and have their avatars running around 
and wait, yeah, and they have an avatar because so that nobody could get killed. But then I think Bruce Willis came, comes in as a p police officer cop or something and shoots everything and buddy, I don't know. But I think it's a cool Bruce Willis film. I'm not, I, I'm not sure. I haven't seen it, but somebody told me about it. The iRobot does this little bit uh, of that, but I don't know whether it's the same. Uh, iRobot no, is not. No, iRobot. No, no, it's really, you know, the people are in their homes and they have, to, you know, to not die because of all the threats out there. They just sent their avatars to work, to shopping and whatsoever, right? <laughs> I would do that in a heartbeat, to be honest, but I, I, I'm, I'll check out that movie. <laughs> so, we'll it's some Bruce Willis movie. I'll, I'll see if I can find it. But this is a this is a very fascinating topic, Marissa. And and let's let's bring it to the today, right? How is this changing the human behavior in the context of, you know, employees, people in the society, and how are we adopting? How, how are we changing the way we behave because of this relationship construct of assigning agency to non living things? And what does that mean for leaders in the business context? <laughs> That's the. <laughs> gold gold standard question right i mean if i knew i don't know I, I i don't know right i mean who knows uh i would like to know somebody who knows um oh, what can i say i mean the problem is that i think two things first most of the behavioral changes happen somewhat subconsciously and, you know, you don't, you know, uh, to give an example, you know, most of the users of Facebook uh, or so, of the, you know, of the red dots, uh, you know, making us addicted to, you know, all the news that ha are happening. And these are things users don't know, right? So their, their behavior, you know, looking at the smartphone all the time has changed sub mostly subconsciously first. And then they realize something's happening in a not so good way when it's unfortunately too late so that's a problem and you know how i don't know i don't know if you know but you know dealing with addiction is is not easy and that's something you cannot change from you know uh one day to the other so this is something that really concerns me and um so that's maybe the negative part of it that the other thing is, you know, you're talking about how should we deal with this? How should leaders deal with this in the future? And um, I, I think there are a few key kind of issues I, or virtues maybe rather, that I think are most important at the moment for me, for myself, and for, you know, the people I know whatsoever. It's, it's, it's kind of a modesty uh, towards technology, towards other people. It's meaning, you know, being kind and nice, meaning like, you know, being vulnerable and saying, listen, I don't understand this stuff. I'm interested, but uh, please help me figure this out. You know, most of the managers are like, okay, I know everything and they don't nothing, right? Uh, fake it until you make it. That's a classic um, paradigm in management. So I think, or I hope that a new paradigm where, where vulnerability is at the top will come up to, you know, basically for the sakes of, of any organization and the employees and the society at large also. And um, it's also, you know, openness to learn and educate ourselves. I think this is, you know, you cannot underestimate how important it is to even to at least try to understand as much as possible. And um, I'm, I'm last, uh, but not least, um, you know, taking a participatory approach wherever possible, you know, involving other people in decision making, interdisciplinary, transdisciplinary work with other people from other cultures um, all over the world. You know, I think um, this, especially in this kind of tech society, is massively important. So I think these three virtues, if you could lead by virtues, I think it would be, you know, uh, modesty, openness, and, uh, um, you know, some sort of participative approach. I'm not really sure how to call this. I think this is massively important. No, I, you know, in fact, you, you, you this is, so AI is, as you can, an emer it's still an emerging domain, right? So the whole 
field of AI and everything from machine learning, deep learning to conversational to the entire gamut. One of the things that at least I work with a lot of large and small organizations trying to build AI data products, right? Using data, use machine learning to build a product. And it's very evident that even in that build out, um, the more participatory their approaches, the more inclusive they are of different uh, talents, like be it data science, algorithmic research, plus data engineering, understanding the shape of the data to subject matter expertise and how this is going to be used in a business context. And like, you know, having a broader group of diverse teams who are inputting into the design of that, they perform better and are more sustainable. I mean, it's very, that evidence is, you know, it's, um, it's coming out very quickly. Now, there, there's always this thing, you know, we, we hear all the negative side of the news, which is like if Facebook's algorithm doesn't do anything right, if Microsoft's, uh, you know, Amazon's train in hiring algorithm starts discriminating people, those gets news because those are really large scale systems. But even on a smaller scale, the value of diversity makes a huge difference. Diversity of thought, diversity of action, diversity of people who are participating in it. But Anyway, you know, thanks for nailing those uh, those three virtues, at least a framework for people to think about when they think about these big problems, right? Now, one of the aspects of the relationship that we're going to have with machines is going to come from trust or some aspect of trust, even though I might be contradict uh, contradicting what you said earlier, which is half of this thing or most of this thing happens at a subconscious level. And trust is probably a more conscious construct that we associate, right? Um, how is this, you know, how, how should we, should we trust AI or are we trusting enough of AI systems or intelligent system that do the work for us? Is it a more complicated question than that? What are your thoughts? On it? <laughs> of course, it's a more complicated question than that. <laughs> um, and I'm happy about it because uh, this will give me a lot of uh, things to work on for the next few years. <laughs> So um, let me start maybe with two things. Uh, so trust in AI, let's say trust is a very, very hotly debated topic because mm -hmm. uh, the, let's say there are two camps, the trust skeptics and the trust believers. So mm -hmm. there are people, you know, who would say you should never trust AI. AI is nothing to be trusted. And there are good reasons for it. And there are philo philosophers that, you know, they argument on a on an interesting basis. Why? For these and this reasons, um, this cannot account for trust. So even if you say you trust AI, that's not trust. Now, as much as I do understand this, you know, okay, but you know, people say I trust AI or I don't. Like, how how do you want to explain this, right? I mean, you cannot say that you're wrong. Okay, wow, that's that does that's not helpful, right? So. Um, and then on the trust believer side, basically, which I kind of call my, you know, kind of place myself in, in, in a specific context is, you know, that in human interaction research. So basically in a human interact, human AI interaction uh, setting, this concept of trust is very relevant because the concept of trust, the way the level of trust pe um, people exhibit towards a system is influence and if and how they use it. Now, of course, there are huge debates on how do you measure trust? What is trust? How do you define trust? And so on and so on. However, we're on a pretty good, you know, uh, state of the art of research here, how to measure trust. Um, so, but let me also get back to the trust skeptics. Um, I, trust and ethics is, are contradictory. I mean, and this is something most of the people get wrong. Like it's a contradiction because um, saying you should trust AI is absolutely the most unethical thing to do. Right. And, uh, <laughs> and if ethically speaking, you know, if you want the zero trust approach is probably the safest way, you know, to, to, to deal with the trust issue because, you know, nobody will get hurt then if, you know, in the best place. Right. And in a legal context or, you know, in any regulatory context, I think the notion of trust is dis is really misplaced. I totally agree there. This is where you have to talk about accountability, reliability, liability, all these things. And trust, I don't see where trust plays a role. However, 
trustworthiness do could play a role there, right? So, um, and maybe to explain here, trustworthiness is and also often conflated with trust. Trustworthiness means or refers to the properties of a machine, the characteristics, right? Um, while trust is an attitude, right? This is something that resides within the human. So these are two very, very different concepts. You, uh, you, you must make this distinction always and forever. So <laughs> I kind of always uh, want to say that. So um, this is what. So I don't know. Did, did, was that clear? Like, there's this distinction yeah. between there are the trust believers, there are trust skeptics. There are good reasons to say, you know, trust is, you know, BS in the whole AI context. So maybe in ten years I'll get back to you and say, hey, listen, Ganesh, my whole research on trust <laughs> just tossed it in the bucket. <laughs> so you know, I, I'm open for that. I'm I'm reading a lot of antitrust uh, literature, so I'm to, I'm in there. I think I'm one of the trust research who does. Um, most of the you know research on the anti antitrust league so that's absolutely i think uh, this is something i'm very proud of actually <laughs> so did you get that was that clear i'm not sure no no you 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 definitely made some very interesting observations here in terms of so i i love the distinction between trust and trustworthiness right and to your point on like you know do you take an approach of either you take a zero touch to pro a zero trust approach which is now extremely conservative because then, you know, you don't trust it. So let's not do anything wrong with it at all. Right. Right. But, you know, most businesses, when they actually approach AI and this notion of trustworthiness, they look at it honestly in a much more, in my experience, at least a much more simplistic definition. They're like, look, what are the decisions it's making? So if it's in a decision support system, is it a high impact decision or a low impact decision? Right. Netflix recommendations on what movie to watch based on Netflix listening to our conversation is going to pop up a Bruce Willis movie for you, some iRobot for you tomorrow, and you get it wrong. Big deal. You'll just move on, search for what you want and move on, right? But you're now looking at an underwriting decision and you're underwriting somebody's life and you misrepresent their, you know, the, the algorithm got it wrong, what they read from the medical reports. And then suddenly you have someone who's looking for was pretty healthy is given a wrong score. Again, may not be that high an impact, but still, I mean, they can contest it and stuff. Well, a medical algorithm comes in, provides a recommendation for a bad, you know, prognosis or a diagnosis for something that the stakes are much higher there, right? Obviously right. you have the loop in the loop. Right, so right. The trust in these contexts are very, very different. So the definition of trustworthiness in each of them may be different or, yeah, agree? I mean, the concepts may say the same, right? Reliability, they both have to be reliable, but maybe for other reasons. One is for to save lives, and the other one is, you know, more for commercial reasons. I mean, it doesn't, I mean, maybe, the, you know, the, 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 the concepts are the same. However, of course, uh, the, 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 the focus uh, must be much, much higher on, or you must be, one must be much more careful. So, for example, I have a colleague, um, it's, uh, I'm working with an Austrian, he's doing work on automated vehicles. And he's also a trust researcher, but in the context of automated vehicles, and I'm a trust researcher, trust researcher um, in the context of conversational AI. So these are a high, this is a high risk scenario, automated vehicles, obviously, you know, you know, here <laughs> the stakes are pretty high, you can die. And then conversationally, I, okay, well, you know, stakes are, you know, you, you probably won't die, but you know, your privacy is at risk. Um, you may, you know, your money may be lost and these are the pretty low uh, risk scenario. And so what we're trying to find out basically is, you know, how do these scenarios and um, trust uh, levels differentiate from each other? And also we're trying to, you know, look at that topic of you know, the whole tech convergence uh, discussion. You know, will eventually all this technology, you know, will be, you know, will, will melt together. You know, now we're looking at trust in conversational AI, trust in uh, Netflix, trust in this kind of system, you know, trying to, to narrow it down for good reasons. And uh, now the next question is to kind of see if we can actually put them all together and say, okay, listen, trust in AI is, you know, conceptually the same, no matter if you talk about automated vehicles, um, the recommender systems, or conversational AI, or if, you know, if there's a huge difference. We don't know, right? So this is where we're doing this. 
Um, maybe just, uh, I think, uh, to, to talk about one thing again about uh, trust, which we haven't touched upon, especially in the topic of automated vehicles, I think here um, the, the, the idea of the importance of trust um, gets, you know, really, how do you say, uh, you can see, can see it, right? So there, I think you heard about, you know, there are many Tesla crashes, you know, where, you know, there was that one Tesla crash by an engineer who was gaming um, and, you know, trusted the car that he would get him to the destination. And he was a smart person. He was, you know, you could think maybe, okay, you know, it's, it's what, what, what's going wrong here? And so, but uh, one of the reasons, you know, um, psychologists, for example, say, hey, this is one example of overtrusting a system, right? This is an example where you overtrust, where you don't um, check the functions and so on, and this can lead to fatal consequences. So there's this overtrust. And then what you mentioned is, you know, zero trust is the undertrust, you know, where you don't use a system and you kind of miss out a lot of uh, opportunities. Or even there's one example of the Costa Concordia where, you know, the, the captain of the ship uh, rely, does, did not rely on the system and only on and his own, own um, intuition and, and experience, et cetera. And this was, in the literature, one example for undertrust, which also led to um, uh, fatal accidents. So what we're trying to also, you know, from a very practical view, actually, uh, what we're trying to, to, to promote is... Um, trying, you know, this calibrated level of trust. And what we mean with calibration is, you know, you calibrate your level of trust to the performance of the system. So this uh, means it's, yes, you kind of have to know, you know, a little bit how to use the system as much as possible. And then, you know, calibrate your trust towards the system. And I think with this approach, um, you promote various aspects you know you know the the critical thinking you still need to uh you still need to apply no matter what you do right and on the other hand also um learning to deal with uncertainty and risk and um so ideally um one would also always you know calibrate its level of trust the problem is just you know with the performance you it's really hard to evaluate it you know, overblown marketing strategies, you know, must be in strategies, you know, <laughs> these are not really helpful. And uh, in, in an ideal world, to kind of finish up my talk here, I feel like I'm talking so much, sorry. In, a, in an ideal, so I have this vision, Ganesh, talk to me. I'm revealing this for the first time now. Give me feedback. I have this vision. I want to write a book and it's called, I Want to Trust Again. So the point is, in fact, wouldn't it be amazing to blindly trust technology and just use it for the best and knowing, my God, these guys are, you know, they're respecting my privacy, they're showing best performance, they're reliable, they're accountable, law is there to support me if things are going wrong. But what's the problem? So this is kind of my vision. My vision is I want to trust again. So in an ideal world, actually, I, I'm, I'm actually pretty, you know, I'm lazy. I don't want to think that much. So what do you think? Is that a good, ti is, is that a good title for a book? It, it is. It is actually a very <laughs> good title for the book. In fact, you know, you, you touched upon so many different things here. And um, one of the things, like I also follow very actively the the crypto landscape and what's the future of I mean, crypto at the end of the day, yes, there is cryptography, but crypto networks really embody how do you build a trusted transaction? That's how it was originally meant to be by mimicking or capturing the human psychological factors like rewards, incentives. How do you build game theory into software, right? That's what crypto networks really is giving us the opportunity to do. And there, there is a lot of intersection in here uh, of what we're doing with automated systems, autonomous systems, AI to what are the concepts that are residual within, look, I should be able to blindly trust a transaction because there is mathematical proof behind it, or there is some other way of doing it than honestly performing a cognitive load of calibrating whether this goes in my trust meter up or down, right? So it's it's fascinating. You, you touched upon so many different things. I think one other thing that... Yeah, sorry. Also, 
no, no, I, was, it, I felt like I was overwhelming you. <laughs> no, no, you weren't. Actually, in fact, I think the other thing I really, you know, I couldn't help think about when you were when you were talking about this is trusting machines is no really not really different from trusting anything else that we do in that context. Because I mean, there is that agency problem that you initially talked about, but you keep that aside. We always calibrate our trust with respect to consequences of that trust, right? So that's a natural thing we all do. When I buy something uh, right. for $2, I don't associate the same level of, oh, do I really trust this is going to work? Whereas if I'm buying something for half a million dollars, right? Uh, versus uh, if, you know, say, same thing in terms of like, who do we trust? You know, does, does it come to, you know, is it given to me by some socially conditioned, credible sources, right? Or is it something that I know I'm close to the source and stuff like that? Those constructs don't really change in the world of AI and the world of uh, intelligent machines. So um, there is a little bit of that, but that's a good foundation for us to build on. And then you still have to really, as you said, there's a lot more research, there's a lot more uh, exploration that needs to be done to see how will this really change our relationship with these systems and so forth. So. I mean, I wish we could go on forever, right? But this is so so fascinating. But I got some I got some quick fire questions. But before that, you know, I listened to your TED talk, and you were talking about what really uh, interested me was, you know, what's your eye in AI? That was your call to action, right? And you were t asking the audience to really think <laughs> about what it mean to me, and it, it really hit home. Can you elaborate that uh, a little bit for me? I can, but let me tell you a funny story. I thought that was the greatest saying ever. Like, what's your eye in AI? Exactly. And it hit home for you. So, yes. But uh, one person came up to me and asked me, so, um, Marissa, I have a question. What do you mean with the eye in AI? I mean, is, is that what's what's with my eyes? I mean, is it something with my eyes to see? And and <laughs> so, it was so it was so funny. I think half of the people didn't even get that and it, like that analogy I was trying to make. But thank you for the feedback. <laughs> That's helpful. <laughs> so what's your eye in AI? I think uh, for me, as a researcher, as a mom, as a wife, husband, daughter, you know, all these things as a no, I'm not a husband, but, but as a wife. But, uh, you know, for me as a human being and an active part of a society. I think um, I want to, or my my wish is to simply, you know, as, inspire as many people as possible to think about your role in this tech-driven society. And I think especially when you're, you know, you have kids, when you have kids in your neighborhood and you kind of think about how do you want them to grow up? Like, how do you want them to live in the future? Because we're building this stuff and we are the only ones who can influence this. And it's hard enough because, you know, big tech companies have a lot of power. And um, I don't know if you want to start fighting against them. But what you can do is you can influence your own perception, your own understanding. And um, you can ex not explain, but you can talk about it with other people, with your kids, with your friends. Like, how do we want to deal with this? Is this really good for our society? Um, and do we really want this? And I think everybody can do something. It doesn't have to be huge. I mean, you can ask your mom, your, you know, your neighbor at the bakery, you know, hey, listen, what's going on with this, all this AI stuff? What do you think about it? It's really easy to start a conversation that may reach far. No, it's it's fascinating. And I'm a eternal technology optimist on one hand, but one of my uh, goals with even uh, uh, the goals with stories in AI is to inspire more people to get become builders in AI, right? In some way or form or fashion, you don't have to write code or build machine learning algorithms, but you can contribute, as you said, to the buildup of this capability that's going to benefit and affect, affect every one of uh, the human beings on earth, right? So it's already very powerful. It's going to get more powerful as a, a, a part of technology. And there's something very personal. This is the reason I actually associate it very well with your call to action, because intelligence itself is very personal, right? What really makes a difference to me to have an intelligent agent doing something for me is going to be very different from what it means for Marissa, right? And and I think um, 
the only way you can shape it for the greater good is to participate. You know, it's like, I don't know, democracy, right? So you just have to participate, pile on, be a part of the uh, society, be, be a part of the community trying to go drive this. So thank you for, um, you know, exploring that a little bit for me. So I have a few rapid fire questions for you and then we can wrap up. Um, you know, do you think um, artificial general intelligence, we're going to see that in our lifetime? And if we do, do you fear it? What worries you? No, 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 no. And I don't want to talk about AGI. I'm not an AGI believer. There's nothing I want to discuss within this topic. Perfect. Perfect. How about, uh, you know, this is probably a, not a rapid fire question, but a question I had in mind to explore along for a long time, but I don't think we are, we are out of time. So keep it crisp. Lethal autonomous <laughs> machines, right? And you have a, you have a problem with that. Autonomous weapons, lethal. Um, can you explore that? So as crisp as possible, um, we should not delegate killing humans to machines. So ban killer robots dot org or so. Um, just go to the website. They do tremendous work. Got it. Got it. Okay. All right. What is one, it's a personal question. What is one personal practice that you employ that keeps you at the top of your game? Um, as I mentioned before, it's specifically reading and engaging with people who think differently and really, uh, you know, then uh, criticize my work, basically, you know, which is fine. But I think this keeps me, what did, did you say, up to, no, what was your? You know, keep you at the top of your game, right? At the you top know, what... of my game. I think that keeps me at the top of my game is, you know, really checking out what people do and why they think differently than I do. That's awesome. Marissa, how can the viewers and listeners get in touch with you? Where can you, where can they find you on the internet? Um, I guess mostly LinkedIn on Twitter. Um, I suspended all Zuckerberg products. So no, uh, no Instagram, Facebook, et cetera, and no WhatsApp. So yeah, find me there. Awesome. Marissa, thank you so much. Fascinating, very different conversation than all of my other episodes. Really? So I'm really glad you actually came on.